Hello and welcome to lecture 15 of this course on convex optimization entitled Lagrange Dual Problem. We're going to go deeper into what duality means and in particular a relation between the optimization problem in hand that is the primal problem and another problem which is somehow related to it that is referred to as the dual problem. We're going to see when the primal and the dual problems give us the same solution. That is, when the duality gap between the primal and the dual problems is zero. On the way, we're going to give a lot of examples, including the two-way partitioning problem, least squares, linear programs, QCQPs, entropy maximization, and the trust region problem. So without further ado, let's get started. So as a reminder, a general optimization problem is one of the following form where its corresponding Lagrangian function that we discussed in the previous lecture takes the following form and its dual function or the Lagrangian dual function is the infimum over x that spans the domain of the function or the problem of the associated Lagrangian, right? And another important thing that we said in the previous lecture was that the optimal value of the problem, p star, is lower bounded by the dual function. So p star is the optimal value of this problem. That is, p star is equal to a zero of x star, right? Now an important question right here is the following. How tight could I make this bound? And why do we care about the tightness of this bound? Well, imagine the extreme case where, you know, I hit the upper bound. That means I can characterize the optimal value of the problem through the dual function, which is something really important. Why is that? Well, in many scenarios, it turns out that, you know, the optimal value of the problem is hard to get. Whereas the dual function is really easy to deal with. Do not forget that. The Lagrangian function is affine in lambda and mu. That said, the problem in the dual function may turn out to be way much easier than the original optimization problem. So yeah, we'll be answering this question throughout this lecture. So there's a sort of gap, right? There's a sort of gap between the Lagrangian dual and the optimal value. We're going to characterize this gap later on in this lecture. So we're going to be referring to this problem right here as the primal problem. The original problem that we have in hand is referred to as the primal problem. Its optimal value is p star, right? Well, on the other hand, since, you know, we're looking at this gap and the tighter this gap is, the better the Lagrangian dual will report an optimal value close to p star. We're going to be looking at an equivalent problem or another problem which is somehow related to the primal problem. That is called the dual problem. And you know, once you look at this gap, it's easily figured out. Once you look at this inequality, it's really easy to figure out what the dual problem is. So we're trying to push the dual G to hit P star. So to be more concrete, we're trying to maximize G subject to a positivity constraint on lambda. So don't forget that this positivity constraint showed right here. Now that this bound is impossible is not true when all lambda i's are not positive. Okay? This inequality followed thanks to the blue term being negative, right? Since x bar is a feasible point, then f i's are negative, so we have to force lambda i's to be positive so that we say that this whole chunk right here is negative. So yeah, this is the dual problem what we have, and we're going to be, you know, using the term dual feasible. Dual feasible is going to be used since here the maximization is, you know, taking place with respect to the dual variables, lambda and mu. So we say that our dual feasible when, you know, those variables are feasible to the problem. So when is that? Well, at least when, you know, lambda is positive and g lambda mu is not minus infinity, right? It's not, it's something finite. So we force this guy to be a finite number. So any couple lambda mu that satisfies both those constraints, both conditions are said to be dual feasible. And likewise, we're going to say that lambda star and mu star are dual optimal or they're the optimal Lagrange multipliers if they solve the dual. 
So what nice things can you say about the dual problem? If we look back at the previous lecture, we said that G lambda nu is always concave. This is always true, regardless of the nature of the primo problem. So that said, you're maximizing a concave function, equivalently you're minimizing a convex function. If you insert a minus here, you're going to be minimizing, subject to positive or non-negativity constraints, right? That said, the dual problem is always a convex problem. That's why this problem is really interesting, okay? That's why formulating the dual, in many cases, turns out to be way much easier to work with than the primal problem. So let's write down explicitly the domain of the dual function. So it's all pairs of the dual variables such that d lambda nu is finite. Note that the dimension as is, we've got m variables in lambda and p in nu. So in total, we've got a dimension of n plus p. It so happens that the dimension dom g could be less than n plus p, as we will see in the next example. So given the conditions where g is finite, it is sufficient to identify the affine hull, the domain g, and just describe it with a set of linear equality constraints. So if we look at this problem right here and just, you know, force that g is greater than minus infinity or strictly greater than minus infinity, then you know the equality constraints are just not there in front of us. So that makes them implicit or hidden in the dual problem, right? Depending on the problem, we're going to form equality constraints that naturally show up or are a consequence of this condition. As an example, let's look at the dual problem of the standard LP. So the primal problem of the LP is to minimize a linear cost subject to affine equality constraints and the non-negativity constraint, right? The corresponding dual is to maximize dual function of the LP problem or associated with the standard LP subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda. So in the previous lecture, we derived the dual function of a standard LP, which is the following. It's minus V transpose B the following condition is true, else it's minus infinity. Now we're going to copy this to what we have right here. So since we're only interested in a finite g, we can form an equivalent problem, equivalent to the dual. As the dual could be written with no approximations whatsoever, we're just rewriting the problem as to maximize this guy, so minus b transpose mu, subject to this constraint. So this is true, this is finite, only when this holds. So, and we shouldn't forget the positivity constraint on lambda, so lambda plus. Now note that this constraint could be written as a transpose mu plus c is equal to lambda, but lambda is positive, so this guy should be positive. Hence, we could also rewrite the dual as such. It is the equivalent problem, but it is not the same exact problem. And why is it not? It's because, you know, the minus infinity of the G, it, it's not explicit, it's not in this formulation. So this formulation does not take into account G equal minus infinity. So we don't have a constraint right here that says, oh, if this guy is not true, then your G drops down to minus infinity. It's just not there. That's one distinction. However, in many scenarios, they will lead the same optimal solution. Now, another very important thing to see is the dual problem of inequality form LP. So just as a reminder, the inequality form LP takes the following form. So we minimize linear cost subject to an inequality affine constraint. Okay? The associated Lagrangian, since we don't have equality constraints, so the mu is not there, we only have a lambda. So it's F0 of x, which is C transpose x, plus lambda transpose. This could be rewritten as ax minus b is negative. So we're going to multiply with the a x minus b. Now collecting terms that only depend on x, we get the following. So we're first going to expand c transpose x plus lambda transpose a x minus lambda transpose b. Then we're going to collect those two terms, right? We're going to have a c plus a transpose lambda transpose x 
find the standard transpose B. Now, to get the dual function, we have, have to find the infimum over X of L, right? So that said, we're going to plug in the form right here. We're going to get now, since the infimum is only with respect to x, then the infimum doesn't take place here. So that said, we can write the following. So it's only the infimum of the first term. The infimum of this guy is 0 if this vector is 0. So if c plus a transpose lambda is 0, else it is minus infinity. So adding the minus lambda transpose b, to this we get now we're going to form the dual which is to maximize dual function over lambda subject to a, a non-negativity constraint on lambda we're going to plug in the form of g so the problem is the equivalence to maximize the function which takes the following form subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda now as we did in the standard form we're going to avoid this case because it's not a feasible solution, it's not in a feasible set, we're going to be working with this. I'm going to put a smiley face right here. Okay, that does the job. Anyways, so we're going to maximize the minus lambda transpose B, which only happens when this condition is true. So I'm going to copy it in the constraint, it's one of my constraints, along with the non-negativity constraint on lambda. What is really interesting about this equivalent dual problem is that it is an LP in standard form, right? So the variable here is lambda. We've got a linear cost in lambda, linear, and we've got equality constraints or affine in lambda and a non-negativity on lambda. So this is actually an LP in standard form. It is so cool. So if your primo is an LP in inequality form, your dual is going to be an LP in standard form. Now let's go back to example one, where our primo was an LP in standard form, right? Now take a look at the dual. The dual is actually an LP in inequality form. So it's kind of a two-way thing. That said, we can say, if my primal problem is LP in standard form, then my dual is LP in inequality form and vice versa. If the primal problem is LP in inequality form, the dual is LP in standard form. Now of course here the variable of interest in the primal problem is x, whereas in the dual it's lambda, lambda or mu depending if, because in example one we had only the new variable in the problem, whereas here we only have the lambda. But anyways, in any case, this is always true. It's LP in standard form, the dual is in LP in inequality form, and vice versa. So let's talk about weak duality. What does that mean? So say I've got my primal problem, which is to minimize a cost subject to inequality constraints and equality constraints. The corresponding dual, if you want to buy D, is to maximize the so-called Lagrangian dual subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda, right? Now, we denoted the optimal value of p to be p star, right? Also, the optimal value of d is denoted to be d star. Now, weak duality occurs when we've got the following inequality. This guy right here is the weak duality property. And by the way, this is not a new thing. We're not saying anything new. This completely aligns with what we said in the previous lecture. In particular, when we talked about lower bound on the optimal value, the primal problem. That is, we proved in the previous lecture that the dual function is always upper bounded by p star. So I'm going to copy this right here and say p star is always an upper bound on g lambda mu. Now, what is d star? It's just the maximum of g, right? So, of course, subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda. So, in particular, we can say that g lambda nu is less than the max of g lambda nu where lambda positive, right? This guy is p star. Now, since p star is larger than all my g lambda nu's, and in particular, larger than the max, so if p star is larger than a function, it is also larger than the max of the 
um, no matter what the constraints on its variables are. So we can go ahead and also bound this by these types. Why is this bound of interest to us? Why did we highlight this? Well, it's the best bound you can give on P star. It's the tightest, best in terms of tightest. Because this gap right here between P star and D star, which is to be more precise, P star minus D star reports a certain gap between the optimal value of the dual and the optimal value of the final. This gap actually has a name. It's called the optimal duality gap and it's always non-negative this is obvious since p star is always greater than or equal to d star now why is this gap important it gives us an idea about the optimal value of the problem so as we said previously sometimes your problem is not convex the primal problem is not convex however the dual is always convex so solving the dual is easy nowadays. We've got a lot of methods to solve them. We'll be talking about these methods further on in this course. And just for the moment, think about convex problems as easily solved problems. So D star is easily obtained. Now, once you get it, it gives you an idea or some intuition about what P star should be or how far should it be from D star. Stuff like that. An example of this is the two way partitioning problem, which we talked about in the previous lecture. So, the two way partitioning problem is clearly non convex it's because your xi's are discrete. That's the problem right here. And not just that, if you want to solve this problem exactly, if you want to go ahead and solve it with no approximations whatsoever, without any greedy algorithm or Greedy, what, what, what greedy algorithm means is it's, it's, it's a computer science term. It's a, it's a method that, you know, it's based on iterations and it basically tells you that you do the best effort you could at iteration k given all previous information. So you don't look into the future, you don't try to improve future iterations. No, at the current iteration, you do the best you could in a greedy way to optimize your cost. Greedy methods are sometimes optimal, however, they, they do not always give you the optimal solution. Well, let's say here you want you're you're desperate and you're looking for the optimal solution. You don't want any method that gives you a near optimal or, or whatever you want to call it. No, you want the optimal solution. Well, when n is small, say it's less than 500, something like that, you know, you can run a simple simulation on MATLAB or C++ to, you know, brute force over all two power n combinations to, to find the minimum of x transpose wx, right? Now, when n is really large, more than a thousand, more than 3,000, this is very slow. So you might come and, you know, run your simulation today and come check back tomorrow. Depends on the power of your computer. However, if you form the dual of this problem, you can solve it in really fast, even though n is 10,000. You can, you can solve it really fast and you can get an idea about the optimal value of the problem. So in the previous lecture, the Lagrangian dual function takes the following form. We're going to write the dual problem. So example three is the two-way partitioning again, revisited. So this is the primal problem. And my g was derived as such, so it's a minus 1 transpose mu, if w plus v is positive semi-definite minus infinity else. Um, by the way, our constraints here are redundant, so if I emit this, there's no problem, right? I can, I'm just good with this, but the reason I leave this, this allows me to form the dual of the problem. Actually, it allows me to formulate h i of x i, which is simply x i squared minus 1, right? That's why we leave it. Anyways, the dual problem right here is to maximize, as before, as always, g nu, which takes this form, minus 1 transpose mu, subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda. Now, again, as we did in standard and inequality form LPs, we're going to avoid the minus infinity and we're going to just maximize this guy right here. So the equivalent problem will be to maximize minus one transpose mu subject 
to a positive semi-definite constraint on the matrix W plus V. And what is V? It was a diagonal matrix. So W is given in the problem. It's right here. But V is not there, right? So V is just a diagonal matrix containing mu1, mu2, down to mu n, right? Just to make sure, yeah, we had it right here. So, yeah, this problem is convex. The dual is convex. No matter what n is, this could be solved f, well, not n, uh, to an order of a million, two million, and so on. The idea here is that complexity is not exponential, as in the case in the primo problem, if you're, you're doing a brute force to solve the primo problem. This is actually an SDP, a semi-definite program, due to the positive semi-definite constraint on the associated matrix W plus V. And, you know, you can, after solving this using sophisticated convex optimization techniques, you could get D star, which will give you a lower bound on the P star, which is hard to get with a sad face right here. Well, I shouldn't be putting a sad face all the time. I'm just going to put a sad face in this type of problem because sad face as in I don't want to wait in front of the computer, you know, for say today's 8 a.m. It's with the date of today, which is 6th of November 2019. I don't want to come back again after, you know, um, 24 hours, so I don't want to check back at 8 a.m. 07 11 2019 because, you know, I might be really sleepy or not in the mood or whatsoever. So you get the idea. D star is fast to obtain, whereas P star, in some cases, is slow. To obtain or sometimes impossible to obtain depending on the nature of the problem okay now let's talk about strong duality so in weak duality we have the following bound strong duality we have equality so the optimal duality gap is zero right imagine how cool this is this is so cool and why is that it's because imagine you've got a problem that is really hard like the two-way partitioning problem very hard to solve However, strong duality holds. So you're going to form an equivalent dual problem that is convex and thus easily solved in real time. And you won't have to, you know, bother about a non-convex problem and primal problem being not convex and so on. You'll solve an equivalent problem or the dual problem in an easy way, but you have to make sure that strong duality holds. Generally speaking, strong duality doesn't hold. So this would be an ideal case, if you will. This strong duality is like an, an ideal case, an extreme case. And usually it doesn't hold, but there's some conditions referred to as constraint qualifications that tell you whether or whether or not strong duality holds. There's many work, many, many work and results that establish conditions on a primal problem where strong duality holds. It depends really on the constraints of the problem, whether they qualify to attain this gap, to null this gap, if you will, or not. Now, one very popular condition is Slatter's condition. And Slatter is for Morton Slatter. This is his paper right here. So Slatter gives a condition beyond convexity, tells you when strong duality holds. And this is, the condition goes as follows. There exists X in the relative interior, so REL is relative, INT is interior, of the domain of the problem such that this point is feasible. That is, FI of X negative or I in one until N, and it satisfies the affine constraint of the problem. So the problem we're, we're looking at is the following. So Slater tells you if you could pick, if you can find me an X that belongs to the relative interior of the domain of the problem, such that this point is feasible for this problem, then guess what? Strong duality holds. This is referred to as Slater's theorem. So the hypothesis here is the so-called Slatter's condition. So one might ask, but what is the relative interior? Well, relative interior is a refinement of the concept of an interior of a set. So this topic has been studied thoroughly throughout the past. And I'm going to show you a book by Terrell Rockefeller. 
very famous book entitled Convex Analysis. It's a very mathematical book. Um, in this book, Rockefeller discusses a lot of topological concepts that, you know, describe convexity, if you will. There's a lot of heavy mathematical stuff in this book. I urge you to take a look at it if you're serious about convex optimization. And what, why I'm picking this book right here is to show you what interior and relative interiors basically mean. So in part two of this book, there is a section that is section six, where Rockefeller talks about relative interiors of convex sets. So if we scroll down to section six, we can see that an interior is actually defined as such. So I'm going to write it here. An interior of a convex set is defined as all points such that there is a positive small epsilon such that you can find the Euclidean ball centered around X with the radius epsilon that falls inside your set C. So if this is your C and you pick a point X and you could find me a radius in which all this ball falls inside C, we say that X falls in the interior of C. There's an improvement of this concept. So what a relative interior is, so a relative interior of any set S are points in S, you can find a positive epsilon such that the ball centered at X with radius epsilon intersection with the affine hull of S falls in S. So this is an, a refinement. It's, 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 it's stronger than an interior due to the intersection with the affine hull. So as a reminder, we talked about affine hull in lecture two of this course. An affine hull of a set S are all possible linear combinations of points in S where alpha i's are free to move in R. Now note that if, if alpha i is positive, um, we're back to the convex hull, right? So here my alpha i's only sum up to one, but they're allowed to move in R. If they're restricted to be positive, if alpha i's were positive, then this is a convex hull, right? So note that this is a relative interior for any set S, regardless if it's convex or not. Now, the relative interior for a convex set is expressed as follows. So it's all points in C such that any point you pick in C, you can find a lambda that is strictly greater than 1, such that lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y falls in C. Now that this is for convex C. So yeah, if you can find me an x that belongs to the relative interior of the domain of the problem, note that the domain of the problem need not, need not be convex, then strong duality holds. Note that my f's here are all convex, so those are convex, which makes the domain of the problem convex. So in this case, you'll be looking for a relative interior that is of this form, right? Because we're dealing with a convex set. This idea here could also be extended to general inequalities, that is, problems of this form. So where f0 is convex and fi's are ki, Convex. So in this case, Slatter's condition would be to find an x that falls in the relative interior of the domain of the problem, but this time such that your x is feasible in the ki convex sense, that is, fi x is less than zero in the ki sense and ax is equal to b. In this case, we say that strong duality holds. So a direct consequence from Slatter's condition is that Slater tells you that if this is the case, then guess what? There exists a dual pair on the star B star that attains the optimal value of the problem. Now Slater's condition is one of many other conditions that are called constraint qualifications that tell you when strong duality holds. So why is this all interesting? Why do you want to solve another problem, which is the dual problem, when you can solve the primal problem, and so on? Let me just give you a small example where the primal problem is just, you know, it's, it's really easy to solve. It's, it's, you've seen this many times. This, the example is easy. You can drive many intuition from this example. Um, it's just the 
d squares solution. So you know we're minimizing x transpose x subject to an affine constraint. Now we all know the solution to this problem that is the following a transpose a inverse into a transpose b is the optimal solution. Why would we want to you know study the dual in this case and see when the if strong duality holds and so on? Well this is easily done when your matrix is in practice this is easily you know when a is let's say of size I don't know 10 by 10 and the cost for Converting this matrix right here is acceptable in some applications. 100 by 100 is still acceptable. What, what happens when, when you've got a matrix of size, let's say million by million or billion by billion? What do you do? In that case, you cannot just go ahead and invert this matrix and say, oh, this is my sol least square solutions, period. This is You didn't say anything wrong. It's true. It's correct. This is your solution. But is it realizable in practice? Could you implement a system that is fast enough to find this guy right here? The answer is usually nowadays in 2019, it's no. If you want a fast system, given the computational capabilities nowadays, you, you can't just go ahead and do that. What people do instead is, you know, this is the primal problem. The optimal solution is x star. The p star cor corresponding to x star is, let's plug that in and x transpose x. So we'll x star transpose x star, right? So we'll do a transpose right here, b transpose a, a transpose a inverse. Then again, a transpose a inverse, a transpose b, right? So yeah, this is your p star. Now let's take a look at the dual. How does the dual look like? The dual, as we saw many times, it's to maximize the corresponding dual function of the problem subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda. Now, in the previous lecture, we derived the Lagrangian dual, which is this guy right here. So we're going to copy this right here. We're going to, or this is the equivalent of maximizing and it's B transpose mu. But we don't have a lambda in the cost, and we're subject to a positive lambda. So this constraint is useless. Hence, we get an unconstrained maximization problem that is of the form, so we're maximizing a concave function that is quadratic in mu, right? So what does Slatter tell us here? So if we go back to Slatter's condition, we can find an x in the relative interior, the domain of the problem, which is also feasible, then strong duality holds. So is maximizing this problem the equivalent of solving the primal? Is it the same? Let's, let's see. So first of all, what is the domain of the problem? It is just all Rn. So the domain is all Rn. I mean, we don't have any, you know, singularity issue with x. x is defined everywhere. You can just go ahead and say my x is defined everywhere, right? Um, now, what are the x's that satisfy the constraint? Well, now we have to be more specific. Um, well, x, for one thing, provided that b falls in the range of a, so let's write that down here. So the domain is all rn, right? And for the system a x equal b, let's see here. So if b falls in the range of a, what does that mean? It means that it's all outputs of a. So for every say x and rn, it's the set b equal ax. So it's all possible outputs or outcomes of the matrix A. Give me all x's and rn and I can give you the set, the range of A or the column space of A. Now you've got another space that is tied up to the range of A which is called the null space of A or the kernel of A is all inputs, so it's all x's, not b's, it's all x's that give me a zero b. Right, you can write this over here, null space of A, our X is such that AX equals zero. So the question here is, can I find an X that satisfies AX equal B? Not always, no. Um, well, for one thing, problem here is that what happens when A is not full column rank? So that means if we look at the least square solution, what happens when this matrix is not invertible? It simply means that, you know, your X is, plus infinity is close to plus infinity and hence p star is plus infinity so it depends on the structure of a and b problem depends on a and b 
whether you can find a relative interior of the problem or not. Well, let's say A, a is invertible, then in that case, you found a feasible point. So if B falls in the range of A, that means there exists X such that this system is true. It means that P star is finite, it means there is an A that generates this equation. That means we have found an X in the relative interior of the problem, which means strong duality. Well, what happens in the other case? What if, what if B does not fall in the range of A? What happens? Well, that simply means that, you know, P star is infinity. We've got some singularity in A. And hence, there is no X that satisfies this equation. So there's no X that belongs into the relative interior. Well, there's no X. Slater tells us that X has to be in the relative interior of D and satisfy the constraints. If one of those is not true, if if one of if x doesn't if you can't find an x that satisfies both at the same time it doesn't mean that you have strong duality it doesn't mean you can prove that you, i don't have strong duality so if if this condition is not true it's not sufficient and necessary it's a one way thing right so in that case we cannot find a feasible point however if p star is infinity that means that there is a vector i don't know what you want to call it let's call it alpha such that a transpose alpha is zero because a is now singular right p star is infinity so a is singular well and this alpha is not zero it's not this zero vector it's not a trivial solution so that said you can say that if i do an inner product of alpha with my b it is not zero okay it doesn't have to be zero so for this choice of alpha what happens to the dual function g of mu well if we plug in g of alpha, we get minus quarter alpha transpose a a transpose alpha minus b transpose alpha. This guy is zero, right? You do this. And we're left with a minus b alpha, right? Now what can we say about this quantity right here? Is it bounded? Is it unbounded? What happens? How can we minimize with respect to, or maximize, sorry, with respect to alpha? Well, in that case, you can, you know, you can always scale your alpha, right? You can always scale this vector right here. You can always say that, okay, if alpha a transpose alpha is zero, then so is two a transpose alpha, right? And you can name your new alpha, or beta in this case, as a transpose beta equal to zero, and your beta is two alpha. You can replace two with a three, or a four, and so on. You can increase the magnitude of alpha. You can do so in an unbounded manner. So this guy is, unbounded above so this could be made plus infinity simply by just scaling alpha and so on right that said your d star is also plus infinity hence strong duality holds so here's a small example where slatter's condition does not hold but but still we have strong duality okay so now we get a bit of feel of what's going on um when we've got a least square solution when we're talking about a least square problem. We know that strong duality always holds. But what happens in other types of problems? Well, let's look at a simpler, well, simpler because it's, it's a linear program. So let's revisit the linear program. We did this in the previous lecture. So we did an LP standard form, standard form, right? Where we showed that the dual is of this form. So we saw that the dual problem of a standard LP is another LP that is in inequality form and vice versa. We saw that the dual of an LP in inequality form is another LP but in standard form. Well, what can we say about strong duality in this case? Well, let's consider first an LP in inequality form, okay? This is the primal problem. Its optimal value is P star. And the dual, as we saw, this lecture is nothing other than to maximize minus b transpose z uber. and by the way in many references you will notice the term a dual and not the dual that said you can formulate many duals of the same problem there's one very important thing to keep in mind imagine this in your mind right now you've got this link between the primal and the, well you should have this link between the primal and the dual or else something is wrong right? You should always link the primal problem with the dual problem because throughout this lecture, we've been studying the dual to get an idea about the primal problem and by, or vice versa, right? So in your mind, let's say you, I don't know, you, you, you tweaked around 
the primal, and you formulated an equivalent, not an equivalent problem, the exact problem, but in another way, P prime, let's say. So it's not like sophisticated tricks or reformulations. No, it's, it's stuff like take Z as C transpose X and then minimize over Z subject to Z is equal to C transpose. So there's nothing fancy being done. Well, to that problem, you can also formulate a certain dual, right? D prime. Now, you, you're you always going to want to, you know, link this to this, but this is not always the case. This is not necessarily true. It doesn't work for all problems. So, so what I mean by this is that you've got a P star right here and a D star right here and a P prime star right here and a D prime star right here. Well, you want to ask yourself this question. Is D prime somehow related to D? Well, no, there's no relation between those two. Even though P prime yields the same value as P, this is very important to keep in mind. Well, going back here to the LP, what can we say about strong duality right here? What happens? Let's say for the moment, let's assume for the moment that case one, P star is finite, and that X star is the optimal solution of P. And let's say that X star, okay, is the optimal solution. That means it should be a feasible point. So X star is less than B. We could rewrite this set of inequality constraints as AI transpose X star is less than BI for all I's in one till N, right? Where AI transpose is a row of A. Okay, that's good. Um, we can further partition this as such. So we can say that for some inequalities, you know, we've got that AI transpose X star is exactly equal to BI for some indices, so for some i that fall in a set j, that is in turn a subset of one down to m, right? For other inequality constraints, we've got strict inequality. This means that, what can we say about this guy right here? Well, we can, you know, let's let's rearrange stuff for the moment. Um, Let's say that, well, let's say my n is five, right? Um, one, two, three, four, five. And let's say for the moment that, you know, my j is just one and three. So that's my j. Well, with a simple permutation matrix, you can multiply p by a such that your third row is now your second row and your second row is your third row. So, so that, you know, we can get consecutive indices just for the, you know, just for the sake of discussion. So we can, we can, you know, we can just say my J is one and two, right? I just flipped at the second and the third inequality constraint. Nothing is wrong with that. So let's say my set J is of cardinality K. So one, two, till K, okay? So there's another matrix, let's call it A tilde, that has, you know, K rows corresponding to those elements. So that is now A1 transpose down to A K transpose. So it's an R K N. So note that right here, all those vectors, once I multiply them with the X star, I get a BI exactly, okay? So we just collected those vectors that activate those constraints. So what can we say about A bar? There's something very important to notice right here. And let's say there is no Z that satisfies this, okay? So let's be in a situation where there is no Z that satisfies my dual. So let's assume that for the moment, that's when you do a proof by contradiction. <laughs> So what we're trying to prove right here is that that Z doesn't satisfy the constraints in the dual. What that means is that if Z positive, we cannot find or we cannot satisfy A transpose Z is equal to minus C, right? So we're going to apply this, since this is element wise, we're going to apply this to some of the rows of A. Um, in particular, let's, under this assumption, take a look at the rows of A for I and J. So this assumption is the equivalent of if Z tilde positive, we cannot satisfy A tilde transpose of Z tilde is equal to minus C Okay, so said differently, if we denote by the set defined by the left hand side a bar a tilde transpose z tilde such that z tilde is positive, where z tilde falls in r k by one, right? If this is a set, and guess what? Minus c does not belong with this set. Well, since this vector doesn't fall or this line doesn't fall in this hyperplane, 
then we can apply the separating hyperplane theorem, which we talked about in lecture two. We can say that there is a vector, a direction vector u, such that minus u transpose c is strictly greater than u transpose a tilde transpose z tilde. So we're just multiplying a u on c and on this guy, and we're saying that there is a u that satisfies this. We can fit a line. So if this is my first set and this is my second set, we can always fit a line that separates both sets. And this line, is, or this plane in higher dimensions, hyperplane, is defined by the direction u. So this is true for all z tilde that are positive since this guy comes from this set which constrains positive z tilde. So we're going to keep this on the side, just keep this in mind. Let's go back to the constraints. So we're just looking at those indices that correspond to j. So this statement is the equivalent of this statement. So all this is equivalent. Okay, um, going back to the constraints, it means that ai transpose x star is bi for i's in j, right? Well, let's assume a vector that is just pushed a bit away from x star. So we're pushing in the same direction of u. So if this is x over, I don't know where, here, we're just pushing a bit towards the direction of u. If this is x star, this is my x. So how do we do this? We say that x is x star plus tu for some, you know, positive t. Okay, so let's see how the constraints look like at x. So ai transpose x is ai transpose x star plus t ai transpose u. Okay, looks good. This constraint right here means that this guy is a bi, so it's a bi plus t ai transpose u, right? Since, you know, t is positive. Now, what can we say about ai transpose u? Well, if you look at the separating hyperplane theorem, we've got an ai transpose u, right? I don't know, here? Yes. So if we look at this, minus u transpose c, I'm going to rewrite the result of the separating hyperplane theorem. u transpose a tilde transpose a tilde. My ai transpose u is over here. Now, since entry-wise, all the z tildes are positive, we can look at the case where z tilde is zero, right? We get that minus u transpose c is simply positive, right? Since this is in particular true for all z's, we're going to pick the z tilde is zero. That means my u transpose c is strictly negative. So this means that we can go back up here and say this is less than zero. So u transpose a tilde transpose z tilde is negative for all positive z tildes. So that means that a tilde u is negative because all my z's are positive. So in writing the forms of the rows of this a tilde u, it's a i transpose u negative for all i's that fall in j. So going back here, We've got that this term is also negative, so we can say that this guy is strictly less than bi. Now we can say the same thing about c transpose x. So c transpose x, which is c transpose x still plus t c transpose u. This guy is negative due to the separating hyperplane theorem. So it came from here, right? It's due to this. This guy is less than c transpose x star. This is true, so what we got from the, simply from the constraints is that, and the cost is that AI transpose X is less than BI and C transpose X is less than C transpose X star for all positive T's. Now there's a contradiction right here. This is telling us something that is very, very contradicting. What is the contradiction right here? It's because you have found an x with a lower cost than the primal cost. So there's something really wrong. You just found me another x, which is not the optimal solution, and achieves a lower cost than x star, which you assume to be the optimal solution. And at the same time, it satisfies the constraints. So what's going on? There's a contradiction, and hence we conclude that the initial assumption is wrong. That means that we can find a z positive that satisfies the dual constraints, which we assume that it didn't, <laughs> right here, and it gives a dual feasible solution. Now, what is the optimal value of the problem? Well, guess what we did here? We only focused on the i's that were, you know, only satisfying inequality constraints. 
I'm going to say that again. We, we, we focused on this set, and if you look clearly at the Z tilts that were used, the Z tilts, the, the other Zs that do not correspond to the J set are not there. Hence, they contribute nothing to the cost. Hence, we, we, we can just set them to zero. So my optimal Z should look something like this, Z tilt and all zeros. So here we've got K size vector. And right here, an M minus K sized vector with all zeros, of course. So what is the D star of the problem? So if we look at this guy right here, minus B transpose Z, we saw that the Zs, if we assume that, let's copy that down here, actually. So my minus B transpose Z star is minus B transpose Z star looks like this. So Z tilde with all zeros. I'm going to put a transpose right here with all zeros. So for those indices that will also correspond to the first K indices of B, we have strict equality constraint. That is my B attains AX in the first K elements, thanks to this partitioning over here. That means that I could simply replace B by AX star. I have a transpose right here and a Z tilde right here. So I'm going to get, and don't forget the minus, I'll get minus X star transpose, A transpose, Z tilde. And what is A transpose Z tilde? Due to the, the dual, it is minus C, due to the dual constraint, minus C. So I'm going to get a X star transpose C, or C transpose X star. This is my D star, which is also B star. My D star should go here, right? Because here's where I initially plugged the optimal solution, Z star. I'll just remove it from here, and it's equal to B star. So strong duality holds. So we have strong duality, but it was only under the assumption that P star is finite. And we've got another case right here. What happens when P star is infinity? Do we still have strong duality? Well, not always. Let's put it that way, not always. And I'll show you this through an example. Let's say I'm just trying to minimize, let's say, X. So note that here we've got only one variable. Simple as that, in 1D, and still we don't have strong duality. Actually, the gap here is going to be quite large. I'll show you what the gap is. So assume that we've got the following. This is the primal, the P star here is plus infinity. When why is that P star is plus infinity? Well, let's do that intuitively. You're trying to minimize X. Look at the first inequality constraint. It's simply telling you that zero is less than minus one. Now, is this true? No, it's not. It is not true. That means your problem is infeasible. You can't just find an x that satisfies both constraints because simply the first constraint is false. Now let's form the dual of this. Now using, we've, we've got the dual written over here, minus b transpose c. So what is my b right here? It's just this vector, right? It's my b, this is my a. So the dual will be to, you know, maximize b transpose z subject to a transpose z plus c is equal to zero. Now let's plug in the values we're going to get. The b transpose z is simply, so if you're just multiplying a minus one, one by z one, z two. So this is z two minus z one and subject to, so your a transpose is zero, one. Your c is z one, z two. And your c is one, right? is equal to zero. Of course, we forgot the positive Z's right here. That means Z1 is positive and Z2 is positive. Well, let's rewrite this. So you're maximizing Z2 minus Z1. So the difference of Z of the entries of Z, trying to maximize the difference, subject to Z2 plus one is zero. Z1 is positive and Z2 is positive. So if you're trying to maximize this cost, what would be the maximum possible you can do given those constraints? So your Z2 is clearly, if you want to activate the constraints, Z2 is a minus one. So you're more or less, under this constraint, you're maximizing minus one. So I'm plugging Z2 equal minus one, and you're get, getting a minus Z1, right? Now you're not activating this constraint because this constraint is telling you that Z2 is positive you're not activating this constraint. So this is not feasible. So what, what I just did is wrong. Um, so anyways, under this constraint, it's easily seen that the maximum of the problem is minus infinity. All you have to do is just push Z1 higher and higher. 
under Z2 is equal to minus 1, right? Now let's take the other extreme where Z2 is positive and Z1 is positive. And you're trying to maximize this, right? Also, it's infeasible because you have this constraint that will not be satisfied. And your optimal solution is minus infinity. So your P star is plus infinity. Your D star is minus infinity. This problem does not have strong duality. Okay, enough for the LPs. Let's look at QCQPs. So quadratically constrained quadratic programs, which we talked about in previous lectures, are of the following form. So half x transpose p zero x plus q zero transpose x plus r zero subject to the same type of constraints where your p zero is positive definite and symmetric your pi's are positive semi definite and symmetric and your Lagrangian for this problem is simply the cost plus lambda times the left-hand side of the constraint. So it's x transpose p 0 x plus q0 transpose x plus r0 plus a lambda transpose. Since we've got m constraints, we're going to write it in somewhat a different form. So since we don't have this ex expressed as a matrix form, so we're going to sum by lambda i half x transpose pi x plus qi transpose x plus ri. So this is my Lagrangian. You can, you can actually have a better form. So we're going to collect the quadratics on one side. They're all multiplied by a half. So I'm going to have a half right here. X transpose. Now I have here a, a function of lambda i. So it's a p of lambda x plus I'm going to collect all linear terms in x. They're all going to be multiplied by functions of lambda and q's. So q lambda transpose x plus some constants r of lambda, where your p of lambda looks like this, it's p0 plus, looks like the LMI, linear matrix inequality form. So sum lambda i pi, this is your p of lambda. Your q of lambda is going to look like this. So it's a q0 plus sum of lambda i qi, and your r lambda is going to look like this, r0 plus sum lambda i r i. So your Lagrangian dual function g of lambda, which is an infimum over x l x lambda, you can just get from the gradient of l. So let's say the infimum is attain attained at x naught lambda, where x naught lambda solves or is obtained from the gradient of Lagrangian by setting it equal to zero. We should find the x naught that nulls the gradient of the Lagrangian. So what is the gradient? It's simply p0 p of lambda x plus q of lambda. Setting it equal to zero, we get that your x naught is p inverse lambda q of lambda. Now replacing this back into the Lagrangian, we get the Lagrangian dual, which is g lambda, that is l x naught of lambda, that is half, this guy transpose, as suggested here, so it's a Q of lambda transpose P of lambda inverse C of lambda, P of lambda inverse Q of lambda plus Q transpose of lambda, P inverse of lambda, Q of lambda plus R of lambda. And we've got it, those two matrices that cancel, and you get a term that shows twice. Oh, and there's a minus right here. I'm sorry about that. Minus. So the minus cancels right here and it shows right here. So a half minus a one is a minus half this term. Q transpose lambda, P inverse of lambda, Q of lambda plus R of lambda, right? So this is the G of lambda. So your dual problem would be to maximize over lambda this dual minus half Q transpose lambda, P inverse lambda. Q of lambda plus R of lambda subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda. So the question here is that do we have strong duality between the primal problem P with optimal value P star and the dual problem D with optimal value P star? The answer lies in status condition. What is the domain of the problem? It's all Rn. We don't have any problem with any x, but can we find an x that is feasible well if you could if you can find an x that is strictly feasible okay lies in the interior of this 
then P star is D star and hence strong duality holds. Let's revisit entropy maximization where in the previous lecture we derived its corresponding Lagrangian dual function right here. And just one small correction in the previous lecture. I'm really sorry about the mistake. Um, this norm I referred to in the previous lecture as the atomic norm. This is not an atomic norm. It's called the dual norm. Okay, so my apologies. And yeah, this is the correction. So going back right here, we can directly form the dual by maximizing the Lagrangian dual function. That is minus P transpose lambda minus nu minus e to the power nu minus 1 minus nu minus 1 to the sum over it, the exponents minus ai transpose lambda subject to a non-negativity constraint on lambda. So note that nu is allowed to move freely. We could easily maximize the cost with respect to nu simply by taking the partial derivative. So, so if we denote this by g lambda nu, you take the partial derivative with respect to nu and set it to zero to get nu, I don't know, star. And what is the partial derivative? Well, let's do it. So it's a minus one plus e minus nu minus one, sum exponential minus ai transpose lambda, set it to zero. So now solving this equation in terms of nu, we get applying log on both sides and using the fact that log 1 over a is minus log a. So this is the optimal nu. Now plugging it back into the dual function g, we get g of lambda, that is g of lambda evaluated at nu star. Now plugging nu star here and here, notice that e to the power minus nu star minus 1 is this guy. So 1 over the sum of exponentials will cancel out with this we're left with a one here so we shall get so the ones cancel and finally the dual function is only a function of lambda is now well after maximization over new guys of course so the problem the dual problem becomes or is just a maximization over lambda as such now note that we could rewrite this as log sum of exponentials as follows. So note that your minus b transpose lambda could be written as, so your g of lambda, which is all this, we could say that this is a log exponential. So instead of a minus b transpose lambda, I could write log exponential of minus b transpose lambda. And I'll keep this second term intact as such. And why did I do that is because I want the difference of logs, which is a log ratio. So it's a minus log ratio as such. Now we've got ratios involving exponentials, that is, we could rewrite it as such. So it's a sum of exponentials using exponential a over exponential b is exponential a minus b. So we could rewrite this as b transpose lambda minus a i transpose lambda. Right. I'm factoring lambda, so the problem is now to maximize over lambda minus log sum of exponentials b minus a i transpose lambda. Now a maximum of the minus is the equivalent of a minimize with by removing the minus. So we could say that we're minimizing the negation of this. Take a closer look at the problem. This is of the same form as in the previous lecture right here. So we talked about geometric programs in convex form, where we did this change of variable, that is yi is a log xi, and we arrived at this form, right? It's of the same form, so you're, yeah, you've got a log of sum of exponentials of b plus alpha i's y, right? So it's of the same form, except that we don't have the log inequality constraint. We've got just a positivity constraint. Which you could you could convert this to a positivity constraint. We don't have affine constraints, however, we don't need them. We don't have them in the problem. That's okay. Well, here you could you could choose your alpha ij's and bij's in a way that you want a positivity constraint on your y's. So that said, we've got a geometric program in convex form. Okay, the last example I'm going to talk about is the trust region problem. Why this is super interesting is that, for one, it is not convex. And two, which is most important here, is that strong duality holds. So where does this problem arise? It's when you've got a, you know, 
you're minimizing possibly nonlinear function that is so complex that it's really hard to deal with this problem. Instead, you're going to deal with a second order approximation problem. That is, you're going to minimize x transpose ax plus 2b transpose x in some region called the trust region. Now, the regions may vary from problem to problem, but usually the easiest region to deal with is the unit ball region. That is, norm of x less than 1, okay? The unit ball region. Okay, so this is your primal problem. And why is it non-convex? It's because a could be non-positive semi-definite. So A is allowed to be negative definite or neither positive nor negative definite. Hence, this problem is non-convex. So the Lagrangian associated with this problem is F0 of X plus lambda transpose F1 of X. It's getting a minus one on this side, so that the left-hand side is less than zero. And we can arrange this a bit more by collecting all quadratic terms in X as such, and then the linear terms in X, which is only this guy, and the lambda, what remains. So if you want to get the dual function, which is the infima over X, of Lagrangian is going to be Lx naught lambda. What is x naught? It solves the gradient of the Lagrangian. Let's get the gradient with respect to x, which is 2a plus lambda i x plus 2b. Set it to zero, you will get that x naught is a plus lambda i. It's not an inverse, it's going to be a pseudo inverse times b. Why aren't we sure that we can use the inverse? It's because a is not positive semi definite. A could be singular, and thus A plus lambda I also could be singular. This also assumes that your B falls in the range of A plus lambda I. If not, X0 is infinity, and hence your L or your G is minus infinity. So let's plug X0 back into the Lagrangian to get the dual function, that is B transpose A plus lambda I, pseudo inverse A plus lambda I, then an a plus lambda i pseudo inverse times b. We forgot a minus here, but this doesn't affect this because we've got a minus twice, so it's plus. And now we've got a minus 2b transpose a plus lambda i pseudo inverse b and a minus lambda. Now, a pseudo inverse property is that this term is nothing other than this term with the pseudo inverse. So we get a b transpose a plus lambda i pseudo inverse b minus 2b transpose a plus lambda i pseudo inverse b minus lambda. We've got a 1 minus 2, that is a minus b transpose a plus lambda i pseudo inverse b minus a lambda. Now all this is valid only if b falls in the range of a plus lambda i, else it's minus infinity otherwise. And one additional thing we should add is that a plus lambda i is positive semi-definite. So this is your Lagrangian dual function, right? And hence your dual problem would be to maximize g. So we're going to admit the minus infinity condition. We're going to maximize only over this feasible region. So minus b transpose a plus lambda i pseudo inverse b minus lambda subject to those conditions. So a plus lambda i is positive semi-definite and b falls in the range of a plus lambda i. So I'm not going to go into the details right here. This is also the equivalent of, notice that we've got a minus twice, so we can minimize instead the negation that is b transpose a plus lambda i pseudo inverse b plus lambda with respect to lambda. And note that here your lambda is scalar. It's note that we can express this problem in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrix A. Since it's symmetric, we didn't mention that. Here I'm going to mention it right on top. So A belongs to Sn that is symmetric. We can express A in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors as Q, right? Sigma Q transpose, where Q contains the eigenvectors from Q1 to Qn, and sigma contains the eigenvalues lambda 1 down to lambda n. If we do such, we can, you know, express a plus lambda i as q sigma q plus lambda i uh, transpose here. Now, since q is unit, unit tree, that is q transpose q is identity, we can write q sigma plus lambda i q transpose. So here we've got a new sigma, that is sigma 
bar in transpose, where sigma bar is a diagonal matrix lambda 1 plus lambda down to lambda n plus lambda. So we augmented all the eigenvalues, we pushed them further by a lambda. That said, you can express your cost now with the eigenvalue representation as, to minimize with respect to lambda, b transpose u sigma bar q transpose b plus lambda subject to, I'm going to replace this a plus lambda i by u sigma bar q transpose in cost of semi-definite. I'm going to n b belongs to the range of the cost of a plus lambda i, which is also expressed by the eigenvalue representation. Now, over here, we can write an equivalent problem that is, oh, that b transpose, since sigma bar is diagonal, we can express it as a summation, as a simple summation. And don't forget the inverse here, the pseudo inverse. So we're inverting the sigma bar, right? We've got a pseudo inverse here, right here. So we're inserting it. And we end up with a sum of b transpose qi square over lambda i plus lambda. We've got a plus lambda here. Subject to, now since this is uh, expressed already in its eigenvalues, to maintain this to be positive semi-definite, it suffices that all the eigenvalues are positive. And in particular, so all lambda i plus lambda are positive. So we've got n such constraints. And in particular, we can replace those n constraints by just picking the minimum eigenvalue to be positive. So if we say that lambda min of a plus lambda is positive, this is the equivalent of all the eigenvalues plus lambda are positive. Right. I can also rewrite this as to minimize the transpose qi square over lambda i plus lambda subject to lambda is greater than minus lambda min of a. Where since b is given, I can just say it has to fall in the range of q sigma bar q transpose or range of a plus lambda i. If we take a look at the dual that has an optimal value v star and the primal has an optimal value p star, then it's always true that p star is d star in this particular case, even though the primal is not convex. And even more, not only st strong duality holds for any optimization problem, regardless if it's convex or not, only if the cost is quadratic, which is what we have, and given that you only have one quadratic inequality constraint, given that Slatter's condition holds. Okay, so that's that's it for this lecture. I hope it was useful. I hope it was beneficial. We did a lot of stuff over here. We started off with a revision on what a primal problem is, what the Lagrangian function looks like, and how its corresponding dual function is computed. We further discussed what a duality gap is and what it means to tighten this bound between d star or the Lagrangian dual and p star. We then introduced the notion of what a dual problem is and why it's interesting because it's always convex and the relation between a primal and a dual problem. We gave examples to show this duality and in particular we gave an example on the standard form LP and we showed that its dual problem is an inequality form LP and vice versa. Given a primal problem in inequality form LP, dual problem is an LP in standard form. We further discussed what weak duality is, gave an example on that, and why in some cases it's interesting. Then we moved to the strong duality case and gave so-called constraint qualifications that qualifies a certain optimization problem to have strong duality. One of the constraint qualifications is the so-called Slatter's condition. That said, Slatter's condition tells you that strong duality holds if you can find a point in the relative interior of the domain of the problem that is feasible. Of course, the problem being convex. Slatter's condition is only given for convex problems with affine constraints. We gave examples on Slatter's condition. These examples include these squares, linear programs, QCQPs, entropy maximization. We finally talked about a particular case where the problem is not convex, in particular the trust region problem, but strong duality still holds. I hope you found this lecture beneficial. Please leave a like on the video if you did and consider subscribing to the channel to receive future notifications about the channel. Thank you so much and I'll see you then.